Father, we just thank you. We thank you. We do. Even in the tough seasons, when we raise that hallelujah, when we praise you, that puts us in position, proper position with you and in you. And you get to be in us. Father, we don't only want to know you. We want you to know us. And so I, I'm just going to read the scripture. I'm going to bring Laura up. We are going to have prophecy tonight. We're going to have corporate and individual prophecy. But the Lord just laid it on our hearts to do something a little different tonight. So it's in Colossians. It says, devote yourselves to prayer and be watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open the door of our message so that we may, we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. So, Father, open the doors for us in this room that we would proclaim your mystery to those that we encounter, no matter where we encounter them. If you bring us revelation, we can then impart that revelation to those that you put in our pathway. That we would be wise in every way and we would act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. So we thank you that you're going to give us opportunity and we're looking for opportunity to minister in the name of Jesus. To bring Jesus into the center of every situation and introduce him to those that we encounter i got to put these back on. Hey. <laughs> Let our conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that we may know how to answer everyone. So that, Father, we wouldn't hold judgments or criticism, but we would hold the key that you give us, the key of opportunity, the key of freedom, healing, deliverance, knowing you and the words that you give us. In Jesus' name. Now, that was a prophetic prayer. Just so you know, there's lots of things to do with the prophetic. There's words, there's prayer, there's music, there's singing, there's writing. And so Laura is going to come up, and as Laura comes up, we are going to take the tithe and off, the offering, rather. So you get an opportunity to sow into the kingdom of God. It's your opportunity to sow seed. And if you are connected to the vine, man, are you going to have some fruit. You're going to have big fruit. So... James is passing out the bucket, so if anybody would like to help. And Laura's making her way up. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I know about Laura. I only know what the Lord's telling me by the Spirit. I mean, I know Laura. I love Laura. But Laura is um, one of the pillars in here, and that's not because it's not a leadership position. It's a position in the kingdom. Laura is a deep, deep well. She has a lot of deepness, a lot of maturity, intimacy with the Lord, and she gets it in a lot of different ways. But the thing is, she, she attains to that. That is her goal every day. And so she's going to bring an awesome teaching. And there's going to be some freedom in the teaching, revelation in the teaching. So please welcome Laura Trivet. Thank you. This is going in and out. Good evening, everybody. Am I on? You hear me okay? No, nope, I'm not on? There it is. Okay. Well, good evening. I'm glad to be up here tonight. As Trish said, my name is Laura Trevat. I'm part of the family here. And it's great because we are family. We come from all walks, different churches, different communities, but we all have Jesus in common. And that makes us family, which is pretty awesome. So tonight my message is what I've learned from Merrill about our place in the kingdom. But before I um, start on the teaching, I'd like to just offer up a prayer. So Father, I thank you for eyes to see, for ears to hear, for a heart to love, for a mind to understand. And Father, I just ask tonight that you open up our hearts and our minds and Lord, speak to us. And Father, I just ask that you use me as a vessel. May what I say glorify you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So I will give a disclaimer before I start. So for those of you that are not cat lovers or hate cats or don't like cats, please bear with me for a minute because I have an illustration. 
But uh, that's my disclaimer. So don't tune me out if you don't like cats, because that's not the whole point of the message. And Dave Jones is going to love this, because he's heard a little bit of the story before. My uh, key scripture tonight is 2 Timothy 1.9. I took the word God from the 8th verse to make a complete sentence. God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So I want to share a little story with you. Uh, last fall, I came home from work one day, and my husband James said, we got a little problem. We've got a feral cat that has kittens in our outdoor storage area. So I said, oh, no, we don't have cats. And a cat and kittens in there. So I opened the door to the storage, and there was no cat. There were no kittens. James said, they're in there. She's just taught them how to hide. So I put out some food and water. Food and water disappeared. But still, you'd open the doors to the storage, no cat, no kittens. So James said, I'll, I'll fix this. I'll put a camera in, and I'll put a... Mu if anybody knows James, you'll love this. Because in our house, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. So James said, I'll put a camera in the storage area, but not a camera we have to watch 24-7. I'll put a motion-censored camera. So only when they move will it record. So there began our fall videos at night. So I'd come home from work and I'd say, what happened today? And we'd go down to the computer and turn the camera on. And 10 times they were out moving around. And we watched them in little fur balls rolling around. And it was so cute. And the mom protective of them and teaching them how to do things. And then it got up to where 25 times a day they were moving around because the kittens were growing. And the mom started teaching them how to jump on things. And so it was great. Well, then I come home one day from work, and James said, we got a problem. We have a raccoon invasion. Not only had a raccoon figured out how to get into the shed, but if you know anything about raccoons, they love to invite their family in. So not did we only just have one raccoon, we had two raccoons that found their way into the shed because there was dry food in there. And these are actually quite large raccoons because the mom, the feral, was about six pounds. But she, we saw them on the camera, the, the mom was whacking the raccoons, keeping them away from the kittens. But we knew we had a problem with raccoons, so we put a raccoon relocation program in place. <laughs> and we trapped the raccoons and um, we decided that they needed to be taken far, far away so they wouldn't come back. So I won't tell you where in Cobb County we took them, but just <laughs> suffice it to say we had a relocation program. But we also knew that the kittens were growing and the mom was going to teach them how to get out of the storage and they would be a great appetizer to the wildlife that is in the woods behind our home. So we knew that it was time to trap the kittens and we found someone that would foster them so that they could be domesticated to be adopted. But <clears throat> once you trap the kittens and the, mo and the mom's no longer nursing, she then goes into heat. So we knew that we couldn't have this repetitive cycle of more kittens. So we knew once we trapped the kittens, we had to trap the mom. So we apprehended the feral. Doesn't she look happy? <laughs> Just thrilled to be trapped. So I called our vet and said, Dr. Tubbs, if we can trap this feral, would you neuter her? Because some vets won't take ferals because they don't know if they're diseased and they don't want to contain, if they don't have a uh, uh, area to contain them in their practice, they won't bring them. And Dr. Tubbs said, yes, if you'll catch her, we will neuter her. And in the world of ferals, there is a, a very gentle practice called trap, neuter, and release. So you do just this so that they stop reproducing. So he said, yes, we will, we will take care of neutering her. So we were so excited. We trapped her on a Saturday morning. I called Dr. Tubbs. I said, Dr. Tubbs, we got her. We got the feral. He said, Laura, that's great, but we close at noon on Saturday, and I don't do any surgery on Saturday. And I said, well, you know what? Feral is going to have a spa weekend. At your, at your vet, because we, at your office, because we are not letting her go, I don't know that we'll catch her again, because cats are smart. And once the kittens were gone, I'm not sure she'd come back in. So she had a lovely spa weekend, and I never told James how much that cost. <laughs> but on Monday, she had surgery. We go and pick her up, and the vet said, 
Well, here's the good news. There are two kinds of ferals. They're fearful ferals and they're mean ferals. And this one is a fearful feral. And she has worms, which isn't unusual for outdoor cats. So you need to give her a pill for 10 days. <laughs> and I said, Dr. Tubbs, I don't care that she's fearful or mean. I'm not giving her a pill. He said, okay, then I'll give you powder and you just need to sprinkle it on food. Now, by this time it was January. So I said to James, okay, so what we'll do, let's bring her home, we'll put her in your office for 10 days while we give her the food, and then we'll let her out. So 10 days went by, we put her in the office. Now let me tell you a thing that's interesting with this whole trap, neuter, release program, okay? The vet does what's called tipping, okay? Tipping is a universal sign of a feral cat. So if you can see her cute little left ear is not symmetrical, the vet tips the end because this is, an, and it's while they're under anesthesia, so it doesn't hurt her. But this is the universal sign so it's visible when you see ferals in the wild that they have been trapped and neutered, which is a good thing, right? And you know they can't reproduce. So she's been tipped. So she's got a tipped ear so you can easily see that she's been neutered. Isn't she cute? So the 10 days go by. A month goes by. Two months goes by. The, the sign on the door to James's office says, do not open, feral inside, okay? But uh, a friend of ours said, you know, you really need to stop calling her a feral. Look at this identity you're giving her, calling her a feral. You really need to give her a name. So we decided to name her Meryl Feral. <laughs> so she went from feral to Meryl, but she now has a new name. So we decided it was time to expand her territory. And by the way, we're on about month three. And so I think Meryl is going to become an indoor cat. So we decided let's expand her territory. So we opened up the office door and gave her room to roam around a little bit more downstairs. She hid under James's desk. You can see the legs of the chair there. We expanded her territory, but she hid. She didn't go out, take the territory, explore. So I said, God, this makes no sense. Look, we've given her food. We've given her warmth, she's safe, we've expanded, we've given her a name, we've expanded her territory, this makes no sense. And God said, now you see how I feel. He said, do you know what? You were the feral. I said, what? God said, you were the feral. 2 Timothy 1.9. God said, I heard you, your cry. I lifted you out of the pit, out of the miry clay. Put your feet upon a rock. God saved me when I called out to him. And he didn't just save me. God called me. And as Paul says, he called with a holy calling. If you're saved, you're called. How many of you know that you're saved? How many of you know that you're called? How many of you are walking in that calling? Because I will tell you that if you were saved, you were called. And if you're not walking in your calling, you will never be satisfied. And you know, many Christians don't even know what their calling is, this holy calling. But I will tell you that this calling is more valuable than any earthly treasure. God showed me when I was in graduate school what my calling was. And my calling was to go into the marketplace and to help others get into their position, align their skills and their love with a job that they could really invest in and excel at. And for over 30 years, I will tell you that as long as I was walking in my calling in the business world, doors opened. When I wasn't in my calling, doors closed. I will tell you, if you're saved, you're called, and you will never be satisfied until you're walking in your calling. We're marked and set apart. 
Just like Merrill has a tipped ear, we're marked. And we're marked with the blood of Jesus. You can see the ferals who have been neutered and released. You can see them at a distance because the tip of their ear is missing. Can people see Jesus in us at a distance? Can they see that we're marked with the blood of Jesus? Or do they have to get close to us to see it? But we're marked and set apart. God has a divine plan and purpose. And thank goodness it is not according to our works. <clears throat> Pharaoh was trapped, was brought in the house, was given a new name, not because she deserved it, not because of her works, but because there was a plan even for this cat's life. I'm the youngest of four in my family. I've got two older siblings that are 10 years older than I am. And as older siblings, they were really the leaders in the household. And I wasn't a natural leader in the family. But I'll tell you, God's calling on us is not dependent upon our abilities. Because it's where our abilities end that grace begins. Let me say that again. It's where our abilities end that grace begins. Because you know what? If it was by our own abilities that we could do it, then we wouldn't need Jesus. But it's where our abilities end that grace begins. And that's where it's important to be in God's calling for our life, God's purpose, not our own. You know, one of the biggest problems in our society is low self-esteem. And you can see it when there's fear and doubt and worry. But do you know as Christians, we, we shouldn't have low self-esteem. And do you know why we shouldn't have low self-esteem? Because we should know what we're worth to the kingdom. James and I had a car that um, we decided we were going to sell in December, so we looked up the blue book value to see what it was worth, and it said between four and five thousand dollars. But do you know what that car was worth? It was worth what somebody was willing to pay for it, right? That's really what it was worth. And do you know what you're worth? You're worth what God was willing to pay for you. And do you know what God paid for all of us, each of us, for you? That is what you're worth to the kingdom. That is why we as believers, and you raised your hand when I said, are you saved? If we're saved and we're believers, then our self-esteem should be never low because of our worth to the kingdom, because of what we're worth to God. New identity, not according to our works, thank goodness. God wants us to know our purpose according to his plan. He takes away, just like he did for Meryl, takes away our identity as ferals. We were feral. We were wild. Do you know the life of a feral is zero to two years? They don't live long. Our life as sinners is short because we don't have eternal life. God takes away our identity as a feral and gives us a new identity and a new name. And we don't have to decide what our purpose is. What we have to do is find out what good works God has prepared for us. I will tell you, you will never be satisfied until you're walking in your calling. Because if you struggle with regret or restlessness or disappointment or depression, it's because you're not in your calling. Amen. Even if you know your calling, we can fall out of our calling because we can choose not to walk in it. But I can tell you God wants each one of you to bear fruit that will endure for eternity. And the only way we bear the fruit that God has called us to bear is walking in our purpose. God wants to expand your territory. Many of us ask for God to expand our territory. There's even a prayer, right? Lord, expand my territory. And God does. He will expand our territory if we ask. But you know what God says? I expand your territory and then you hide into the desk. You don't take the land I gave you. And I will tell you, for many of us, 
God will expand our territory even when we don't ask because he has a territory for you to take. And he knows you'll never ask for it. But God is expanding your territory in order for you to fill your pur purpose. So let me ask you this. What happens when we wake up and say, God, how did I end up here? You know, this isn't where I thought I would be in my 20s or my 30s or my 40s, or you fill in the blank, whatever the year is or the decade is. What happens when we wake up here and, and we don't know what happened? We don't know how to, A, find our purpose or get back into our purpose. So I want to give you a, a simple way, and we'll close with this, but how do you find your purpose? If you know your purpose, how do you reconnect with your purpose? And we're going to go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. So let me walk you through this, and then I'll close, because I think it's important. Romans 12, chapter 1, a living sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What you do with your body or your temple determines your success in life. What you do with your body determines your success in life. Because we are to be a living sacrifice. Remember, it is not our works that justify us, but it is giving ourselves as a living sacrifice. And a living sacrifice means we're giving who we are. So as Romans 1 says, a living sacrifice, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. But let me tell you something. The sacrifice does not make you holy. The altar makes you holy. Paul said our calling is a holy calling. So in order to walk in our calling, it must become a holy calling. In order for it to become a holy calling, we have to give our all. We have to give ourselves as a living sacrifice and say, God, I'm all in. If I'm going to walk in this calling, if I'm going to fulfill what you've called me to do, Lord, then I give you my all. And that is giving ourselves as a living sacrifice. Many of us may have done things that were unpure, unholy, sinful. But once our identity changes, once we're saved, once we're called, then we can't do these things again. There are things I've done that I wished I hadn't done, but you know what? I give myself as a living sacrifice to the altar, and the Lord makes me holy. Who gave the first living sacrifice? It was Jesus. God gave his only son as a living sacrifice. So what is the least that we can do for God? God has a purpose for you. And in order to find that purpose or to walk in that purpose again, you've got to give yourself as a living sacrifice. Number two, Romans two, 12, verse 2, renewing your mind. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we submit our bodies as a living sacrifice on the altar, we're also, we're also sacrificing our mind. We've submitted our mind. We, thank goodness, cannot renew our minds. God renews our minds. But it's only in giving ourselves as a living sacrifice that we allow him to re renew our minds. The world teaches us to ask, what's in it for me? There's even an acronym for that. It's called WIFM. What's in it for me? In the business world, you see it all the time. You're negotiating a deal. Well, what's in it for us? What's in it for me? What's in it for our company? And if we're asking what's in it for us, then we don't have a renewed mind. It's only when we ask what's in it for God that we know he has renewed our mind. But do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. So 
So you ask, how do I find out what God's will is for me? Give your body as a living sacrifice and renew your mind. Because only when your mind is renewed are you able to test and know what God's will is. Let's move on to verse 3. Humility. For by, by the grace given to me, I say to each one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Now here's the great thing about a renewed mind. Once your, once your mind is renewed, your mind becomes a realist. Your mind becomes a realist. We start where we are and ask God to show us what he wants us to do right where we are. When we know our value, we are humble. What are we worth to the kingdom? We're worth what God was willing to pay. What was God willing to pay? The sacrifice of his son. Therefore, that is our righteousness. There should be humility in that. When we know our value, we can be humble. Why did Lucifer fall? Because of pride. What is pride? Pride's the opposite of humility. The greatest deceit of the enemy is pride. And if we become self-righteous and prideful, if we start looking at whiffum, what's in it for me, then we can't receive the glory of the Lord. But the greatest, the greatest weapon of the enemy is pride. If the enemy can get us to be self-righteous or prideful, then I'm telling you, we fall out from under the will of the Lord and the purpose he has for us. Humility is step three. Four, finding your place in the body. For just as each of us has one body and many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, each member belongs to all the others. In order to find your calling and your fulfillment, you have to find your place in the body. God did not design us to be alone. He designed us to be part of the body, part of the family, to be accountable to each other. We're individuals, but if we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, renew our minds, walk in humility, then we will find our place. You've probably heard the story of the bricklayers, of a man that walked up to a bricklayer and said, what are you doing? And the bricklayer said, well, I'm laying brick. So he walked down the line and walked to the next one and said, what are you doing? And the bricklayer said, I'm building a cathedral. We find our place in the body. For like the bricklayer, building the cathedral, we all have a part in the body in building that cathedral. And finally, Romans 12, verse 6 through 8, find your charisma. These are your different gifts, and we all have different gifts. You know, often we think of charisma, we think of that charismatic person, we say, oh, they light up the room when they walk in, they've got charisma. But do you know the definition of charisma is a divine conferred power or talent? The charismatic gifts are the expressions of God's gift to us. Remember where grace begins? Where ability ends. When you function in the gift that God has given you, you will be charismatic. If you're walking in the gift God has given you, by definition, you will have charisma. You can be an intercessor and have charisma. You can have the gift of hospitality and have charisma. Charisma is a divinely conferred power or gift. So steps to finding your place in the kingdom, giving ourselves as a living sacrifice, be transformed and renew your mind, walk in humility, find your place in the body, and find your charisma. From Farrell to Merrill, God has saved us, and God has a calling for us. What I learned from Merrill about our place in the kingdom. Father, I thank you tonight for your man of heaven. Father, I thank you for using me as a vessel. 
And tonight, Father, I pray that we as the body and we as the individuals, if we're not walking in the purpose you've called us to, Father, that we will draw near to you and you will draw near to us and realign us in the purpose so that we may bear eternal fruit. In Jesus' name. Okay, I know Joanna already has a corporate word, and the Lord's given me something as well. So this is corporate. It goes a little bit with Laura's message. Oh, turn the light on. It's right there. Okay, just take it, because, you know. And this is, in, <laughs> this is in Ephesians. It says, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first, wait, in order that, that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. We're included. We heard it. We received it. We're included. We're his. When you believed and you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise and glory of his name. And so, Father, we release your word over this corporate body, and we thank you. We declare and decree, Father, that we are marked. Everyone in this room is marked. If you've got Jesus and you have that relationship with him and the Father knows you, just wave to him. Let him know you are so thankful so we just thank you, Father, that we have relationship with you, that we are marked with your mark, and that we don't have self-esteem. Self-esteem, Father, is thinking of self. It's self-esteem. If we even look at that word, we thank you, Lord, that we are identify, we identify with you. You are our identity. We are confident in you. We are confident that you are taking us to places and through places. And in those tight places, there's so many people in this room that are in extremely tight places. And they are not just weary. They are hopeless. And the Father says, in that tight place, in that really tight place, he is releasing you to a new level of worship. What's your name? Angela. He says, you are my worshiper. Angela, he says, you love me and you release the fullness of me. And I sing literally back to you. You have a forerunner anointing. You have a breaker anointing. When you get up in the morning, the demons tremble because what is she going to sing now? What is she going to do now? What is she going to write now? The Father's given you the gift of scribing. And he says, write those songs. Write those worship songs. Continue to sing unto me because in that singing, my daughter, he says, that is your freedom. That is your freedom. I am bringing you not just freedom tonight. I'm bringing you freedom freedom for your life forever more. You're going to just stumble into your calling because you have sought me. You have sought me. So you're not really stumbling. You're falling into my arms, says the Father. I am holding you. People think you're strange. They don't understand you. And God says, I love you. I've put my approval on you. You are marked with my mark. And he says, don't look at what the world says. Don't look at what people say. I made you that way. You are absolutely unique. You are unique. And the people group that you touch will be unique. And they will be the unlovely and the unloved and the rejected and the broken. And you are going to be able to minister truth and the gospel of the living Jesus Christ. So stay on track, my daughter, he says. I love you and I have blessed you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm coming. Coming. My saga continues, so you guys know. I know you thought the walker would be gone, but I just have to tell you that besides getting three hip surgeries, I decided to break my femur bone with it. So I have to recover on the femur bone, but I will eventually be walking. Yes. So I'm like, what a season. But anyway, God, God's working through it all. So, Okay, so on Tuesday, the Lord gave me this word. 
um, he said, um, I am marking my bride in this hour. I am marking her in the place of intimacy. I am calling her back to first love. In this place, I will place the seal of my love over her. This seal is as unyielding as a grave. It is a seal of my intimate love for her. And out of this marking, I will reveal my secrets of my plans. For there are heavenly strategies and truths that I will show those in this hour that say yes to this place of knowing me. The knowing me that takes place between a husband and a wife. This is where the two become one flesh. But with me, you will become one spirit. My Holy Spirit revealing to you the treasures of my heart. So come away with me. Say yes to my invitation. Set your heart before me. Return to first love. And um, this comes from Song of Solomon 8.6. Set me like a seal upon your heart, like a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, and jealousy is demanding, and as cruel as the grave. It flashes and flashes of fire and most vehemently flame, the flame of my Lord, the flame of the Lord. And the other thing the Lord showed me about this is that there is a, a corp, there is a unified call right now to this place of intimacy among the body. And it's kind of unique because people are saying the same thing. It's not just the houses of prayer. It's like all these major ministries that are bringing the kingdom in this hour are, are calling us back to first love, back to intimacy, back to this place. And the other word the Lord said to me is, if you don't get this place right, if you don't come back, you will not reset correctly. And just like the bone in my leg, if it doesn't heal correctly, it'll heal crooked. It's not that God won't use you. You'll just be out of position for what he's called you to. And like what Laura pointed out, that is that marking coming back into that positioning and stepping into fully, as she said, whenever she was operating in her call, the doors were open. But when the doors closed is when she wasn't operating in her call. And just like that, that's how it works. So this place of intimacy is so important for the body in this hour because he's going to release his glory. We're headed there. We are getting closer to Jesus' return than we, we first. I mean, it's crazy close. So he is going to release his power. But this place of knowing him is so important in this hour. And I've never heard a corporate, a, a unified call like this among people who don't know the language. It's, it's just amazing. So. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of piggyback on that and um did you have some, oh I didn't know what you were doing <laughs> and and we've all been hearing you know new wine new wine that is the new wine the teaching that Laura had the word that she had the part the word that I had even for you that's new wine it's it is being in position it is knowing him but it's him knowing you all your stuff guess what he wants to get rid of that stuff when he highlights something inside us that is ugly that we don't like, that we want to run from, that we want to hide from, just get on your knees and say, Father, you're highlighting something that's ugly inside me, and I cannot do this, but your grace and your blood and that cross has taken care of all of it. Change my heart. And that word, the word of God, will change your mind and your heart will be changed. But Coach, I have, <laughs> I have something for you. This is so cool. <laughs> but the Lord keeps, he's repeating words. He's repeating certain words tonight, and one is tent. And it says, I'm going to read it because this is what I heard, and then I saw it. Um, I did not talk to Joanna, um, you know, before the service. I didn't talk to Laura, like, exactly what are you teaching? And so some of the key words that he's been saying, he's saying them. We're not, we didn't rehearse any of this. But, Coach, it's in Isaiah, and... Um, it says, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent, curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. And when I heard that, the Lord said, you thought you were stretched, you thought you were out there, you thought you were just gun-ho for Jesus, and you are, but guess what? There's more. He is going to pour more and more and more. You're going to be a, a constant, constant overflow of him, of his presence, of his word. And, and then it goes on to say, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will di dispossess nations and settle in their desolate lands. Do not be afraid. That means we have the opportunity to fear. 
Okay? Because when oh, I'm not going to fear anything. I know Jesus. Do not be afraid. Jesus even said that. Do not fear. It's in the Bible 365 times. Okay. So it says, do not fear. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humili humiliated. You will not forget the shame of your youth. And remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For that your maker is your... For your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty is his name, the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer. He is called the God of the earth. And so, coach, that's what he says to you. Because he's going to take you into such deep places. You, in the natural, you're going to go, I don't know how to navigate this. There is absolutely no way. And the father says, you're right. You don't know how to navigate. But he says, what you do know how to do so well is you know how to partner with my Holy Spirit. You know how to, you know how to partner with Holy Spirit. He is your best friend. You know how to partner with him. You know how to agree with him. You know how to take his correction. You know how to take his direction. And so he's going to be very specific with you. And you're going to, it's almost like you're going to have blueprints in some instances. In some, it'll be a walk of faith. And that's where the do not fear will come in. Okay. But you are going to be taken to extreme heights. You're going to be able, you're going to, you're going to minister at, in a level of deliverance. And I don't just mean people that are possessed. You know, I mean people that think they, they, they are so hopeless that they're worthless. People that have been chronically ill or sick for years and years and years. The Father's going to use you to minister healing. And so, Father, we just bless her in Jesus' name. We just thank you for your word, that your word does not return void. We thank you, Father, for her partnership with the Holy Spirit and her agreement with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Chris, do you have something? Go. That you were talking to before. What was your name? Angela, so when you were worshiping the Lord, I looked over at you and I saw a picture of you as like a flower child, um, a flower girl, flower girl. <laughs> you are kind of like a flower child too, but, <laughs> and the flower girl at the wedding, everybody's always so happy to see her because she leads the way for the bride. And you, and you were leading the way for the bride, but there was no music playing. It was, it was the verse, it was coming out of your mouth, but it wasn't your voice. Who is the Lord Almighty? And you, you kept marching towards the altar saying, who is the King of glory? The Lord God Almighty. And I believe it's a call of evangelism on your life that you're going to lead people to that altar, to the bridegroom. But it was, it was just very sweet. It was very sweet. Father God, we just, we just pray into that, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the willing spirit that we see here, Father God. We thank you for the brotherhood and sisterhood that you place us in. But God, we cry out for those who are not part of that. And we just, we just lift up this woman to you, our sister, Father God. And we ask you to bless her, to anoint her, to use her, to draw others to you, Father God. In Jesus' name. Does anybody else have a word for her? Father, just speak peace and blessing over Angela. In the name of Jesus, I command that only the Holy Spirit shall come close and prosper over her. Angela, there's no way that you can mess this up. <laughs> this is not your deal, Angela. You are his deal. So, Father, I thank you that there's all the suitcases up there and deal or no deal, and everyone has gotten the million dollars in it. It doesn't matter which one you pick. The Lord says, pick any one, because <laughs> I've, I've already given you the answer. So I thank you that in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, Angela is complete. I thank you that it is finished. Lord, she is flawless. I hear that song, flawless. The Lord's singing over you. You are flawless in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Prepared beforehand in Christ, Angela, that you should walk in them. You are his masterpiece, and you can't do anything to mess it up. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Bill, I think you, don't you have something? 
Earlier, I thought you had a word that you wanted to share. Yes, Bill, you're Bill, right? You're pondering still? Okay, does it, Laura, do you have something to share? No. Anybody else have anything to share? Diana? No. Patricia, you've been creating. Can you come up and show us what you're creating, what the Lord's speaking through those paintings? Okay, uh, for the word that you can't mess this up when God puts something in your heart, uh, it's his spirit that'll do it. But all things work together for good. So this is many things, and I've had many things, but uh, it, it did turn out to have quite a bit of fruit, uh, walking on the water and walking on the rock, standing on the rock. So, uh, and then there's another one here. That's okay. It's very, very fresh. And I'll grab one more. It is really fresh because I can prove that. See, it's on my hair. I'll grab one more. Hold on. She's coming back. <laughs> I've been marked. It's green. New life. Prosperity. That's what that means. <laughs> Here she comes. And this is Bloom in Him. And... Wherever I was before I met Christ, I thought I was supposed to be somewhere else. And I kept seeing these cheap little signs at, at Dollar Store or wherever I, I would shop. And it said, bloom where you're planted. And the Spirit was just trying to teach me that for years and years. And when I was gardening uh, this little three foot by three foot area, I found an old letter that I had written 10 years prior, and I was going around the same mountain of blooming where you're planted. And now I can bloom anywhere I stand because I stand on holy ground. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Ken's got a word. I would got this before the service, and, and I saw uh, Christ standing with a handful of seeds. Uh, in the almost above the building here and he said I planted seeds and he said the people in the room are the seeds and God is bringing tonight a lot of you the seeds are coming it's been hard you've been in the ground you've been pushing up you've been doing everything you think's right but tonight he's letting you break through the ground to see and understand your calling your that Laura was talking about. Tonight you'll understand your calling and your destiny. I believe there's an anointing tonight, even after Laura ministered, there's an anointing for to find callings tonight. Through the words that people will give, through just God telling you. Anybody need to find out what their calling is? Not sure. No, everybody knows their calling. That's good. But I, I did have, you need your calling. The lady, you getting, I, I, this is crazy. I don't know if it's, uh, I just saw you as a little girl that you were on top of a hill on a tricycle and you said, I'm going. You know, full, full blast. But he said, that's where you are now. He said, get on a bigger cycle. And go full blast to the things of God he's called you to. Don't, don't mess around the top of the hill any longer. Just take off. Does that make any sense? Does that make any sense? know Jesus Christ with us, with people that know Jesus Christ.
being here is a manifestation of truth. And to be called out, I don't know if you know, Angela means messenger. I can't be a messenger unless I completely believe in Jesus Christ. I can't speak without him. So to be called out tonight is baffling and amazing, ungodly, and I'm so blessed. I'm so grateful. I'm on my knees. So during worship, there was a phrase that was in one of the songs that just caught my imagination. My melody is my weapon. Don't you love that? My, my melody is my weapon. Okay? I love that. You know it's biblical? This is King Jehoshaphat. You know, and his, his uh, nation was, was being attacked. And... You know, Jehoshaphat was a, a man of God. He's, I think he, in many ways he was one of the more godly kings. And Pick up this story here. There's like four different countries coming against his. And this is in Second Chronicles 20, verse 18. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before Adonai, worshiping Adonai. The Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and the sons of Korahites stood up to praise Adonai, God of Israel, with a very loud voice. They rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets, and you will succeed. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire, and they went out before the army. I mean, don't you love this? You can sing? I want you in front of the army as they go march marching against the enemy. You're in the front. By the way, when you came in, Amanda Wright, a Angela, First thing you did was you bowed down in, in worship and song. Your, your, your song is going out before you. Okay? Um, but anyway, as it turned out, when he, and, um, they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord. His loving kindness is everlasting. I mean, what a phrase to go out and battle with. Give thanks to the Lord, his loving kindness is everlasting. And when they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were routed. The melody, the weapon, routed the armies. So, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When troubles come, try singing. Hey, a little while ago I was praying and I had a, uh, I had a, boy, this has got feedback, doesn't it? And I can live with it if you can. Okay. I had a vision of a cluster of grapes and, um, and they were crushed and the Lord started talking to me about the new wine. There's several people in the room, several of the leaders here have been praying for the new wine, waiting on the new wine, the new wine skin. And uh, I just wanted to point out that, like Ken, I know you've been through some crushings, but you're the new wine. And Joanna, you've been through some crushings, and, and you're the new wine. You know, you think about the wedding at Cana, 
where he put the water in the six water pots, right? Six the number of man, we're clay pots. So we're made of water, like what, 98%? And when, as he took the water to the tenant, it changed to wine. And the Lord has saved the best wine for last. So, Angela, you've been through some crushings, but you're the new wine. You're the new wine, and all that will make sense to you this year. So rejoice and celebrate, okay? Okay. Pray through it. Yeah. A lot of people in this room that have been crushed. And we don't understand what the new wine looks like, and we don't know how to navigate through it. So if you wouldn't mind praying. Lord, I just thank you that you turn water to wine, and not just any wine, the best. I thank you, Lord, that you're transforming us by the renewing of our minds like um, Laura taught. Thank you for the meaning of Merrill. So, Lord, we just, um, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done in impact ministry as it is in heaven. And we, those of us who've been through crushings, we thank you. We thank you for the great work of your spirit, for the purpose of your kingdom. And we count it all joy that we were counted worthy to suffer for your name's sake. Jesus, what a great Savior. Amen. OJ. Won't be worried. I heard the Lord say, he says, say this unto my people. I have marked you, says the Lord. I've given you a new identity. I've given you a purpose and I have given you a destiny. And not only did I do that, but I brought you into my house, says the Lord. And I opened the entire house to you. Why are you still hiding in the box? For I did not save you to live in the place called fear. I saved you and I made you a member of my household, says the Lord. Know this day, says God, the old has gone and the new has come. Now is the season and the time to step out. I will not drag you. I will not push you and I will not force you. If you want to remain in the place that you're in, says God, so be it. But know this day, that's not, that does not change where I have ordained you to be. For I've opened up my kingdom and I said, come, come, come and enjoy me. Come and enjoy, enjoy your father's house. But it's up to you to take advantage, says the Lord. For some of you are still saying, well, I don't deserve to be here. But did I not say tonight, says the Lord, your value is not based on you. It's based on me. It's based on the price I chose to pay for you. I gave my son. He gave his life. He marked you with his blood. The enemy know who you are. I know who you are. Do you really know who you are? Because when you come into the revelation, says God, of how awesome you are in me, then you will begin to explore my kingdom. Come. There are many rooms in my house. Why are you hiding out in a box? It's time to blossom, says the Lord. It's time to blossom. But the choice is yours. It's not working. So when you were prophesying, OJ, I was seeing children Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of children. I don't even know how many. And God said, those are y'all. That's us. And we were running in heavenly places. And the grass had to be about this high. And we were running and calling after him and following him. And we did not care what was in front of us, what it looked like. We didn't care what the peril might seem to be. And yes, get out of the box and run in the fields with the father. Um, I did have someone, we're going to try to close like around 9 o'clock, so we have a couple minutes, but I had someone that um, 
did come up to me and they said, I really am not sure of what my calling is. And so what I'd like to do after we get off the air is to, um, if any of the leaders, if anybody would volunteer to, um, if anyone wants prayer for their calling and their purpose and they don't quite understand what it is or, you know, we can't tell you what it is. We're not going to tell you. The Father's going to identify it for you. But if who wants to help me possibly pray for people? There's some people. So if you don't know your calling, not sure, you're in a hard place, um, we'll be happy to pray with you. And um, just want to put that out there. Does anyone else have a word? Because otherwise we're probably going to. Oh, Princess Diana, come on up. Because I, I think we'll, we'll close after this. She's Princess Diana. Well, it's actually just scripture. And it goes along with what Laura had tonight. It goes along with all the other words. And the scripture is Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But not I but Christ who lives in me, the Son of God who died for me. And this is who we are, for I have been crucified with Christ. We, were, we died, we were buried in, in baptism, and we rose again to a new life in Christ Jesus. And that's the meaning of, of Galatians 2.20. And in Colossians, it says, for Christ who is my life. That's how we walk this out, is walking it out and knowing that we have Christ. The greater one lives in us. We actually have the whole Godhead that lives within us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wow. Go for it. I got a word for you. And uh, it's from 1 Kings, and Trish is going to come over here with me, and we're going to pray over you. 1 Kings 18, 43. And he said to Ken, Ken, go up now and look toward the sea. So he went up and he looked, and he said, there's nothing. And he said, Ken, go back. <laughs> look again. Seven times. And it came about the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, go up. Ken, and you say to Ahab, Ken, prepare your chariot to go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. And in a while, the sky grew black and the clouds and the wind came and there was a heavy shower and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, that's you, and he girded up his loins and he outran Ahab to Jezreel. And the Lord's saying, tonight, tonight, you're outrunning Ahab. And in this season, this is what he says, Ken. So I want you, Trish, you just put a hand on him because I can't touch him right here because I've got to read this. And he says, Ken, this is, this is a both and season. So this is a word. This is a first fruits that's going to the body, but it's going to start with you. Uh, the, the scripture uh, on the word on the screen said, we receive your R-A-I-N. And he said, tell Ken, receive my R-E-I-G-N. Ken, receive my reign, or another good title for this word would be, make room for me, Ken. Or another might be, clean out your closet, make room for the new clothes that I am sending you. Better yet still, make a room ready for me, Ken, to remain with you. Make your body, Ken, a place of presence for me to dwell, and your house a place of prayer. I am looking for sanctuary cities. I'm looking for sanctuary sites, not the kind that the world gives, but you must move out, clean out, clear out, so I am can come into this space. Now, Ken, this took me back. I don't know if it will you, but this is what he said, Ken. How much of me do you want, Ken? How much of me do you want, Ken? He said, whatever you empty out, I am will fill. Whatever space that you clear out for me, I am, will remain in. Will you have room for me, Ken, to R-E-I-G-N in you, Ken? Will you make a room for my R-E-I-G-N, for my rain? Because the rain's coming and you can't see it right now. It's as small as a, as a man's hand. But go back, Ken. Look again. The rain is going to fall. So... 
This is not okay. So what I was hearing is she was praying that, and the Lord says, "Ken, you will be dogged no more by Jezebel. You will not be dogged by that." awful spirit. You will not have to contend with Ahab who does the dirty work. The father says tonight is the night you can stand up on the inside. You can stand up on the outside. And the father says I am going to fill you. I am going to know I am going to know you in ways that you have never allowed me in. But tonight is your night. This is your night. This is an absolute turning point. Do not go by your feelings, son. Do not go and, and do not tally your past up because the past past is the past and the blood took care of it. The cross took care of it. He says, set your face like flint. Look in my eyes. Look up and stay down. Stay down at my feet. And I am not only going to raise you up, I am going to pour you out. You are truly that new wine. You are truly that new wine. So tonight, shake off those grave clothes. They do not belong to you. You, you put on the cloak, the multicolored cloak of Joseph like I gave him. You are a man of many dimensions and the father says bust out. Bust out. All hindrances. Put them just lay them down. They've been in your mind. They're strongholds and as you, as you contend with that stronghold and you shut it down in the natural and in the spiritual realm, I will flood your mind with my word. It will take root in your heart and you are going to bear so much fruit. You're going to be throwing fruit faster than you can handle it. You're going to have heavy limbs because it's going to be blooming and growing and it's going to be rich, rich fruit, full of flavor. So the father says, go where you've never gone in me. And I promise I will go where you've never let me go. I will be in you and you will be in me and I will know you deeply and intimately and you will continue to release my word. But I yet, I'm even going to change the way you prophesy. I'm going to change how you deliver it. I'm going to change the words. It will not be familiar to you, but it's going to be all me and you will be so comfortable in this new skin. You're going to go, why did I wait so long? And the father says, do not worry and do not fear. I am the redeemer of time. I'm the keeper of time. It will be as if the, the past is just going to be brought into, it's like all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's you can. So do not worry about what has happened in the past, what you think may be wasted. He uses everything and he will bring it into fruition. And you will change lives in a way you never have been able to before because Jesus Christ will be speaking and talking and moving. And the glory of God will be so evident in, in your footsteps, in your voice, in your presence. And you will move back and he will move forward. And many, many will be set free. Thank you. Hear the Lord saying that. In these last days, he is pouring out the spirit of Elijah and that you are among those of a company of prophets that he is calling forth in that identity. And the Lord said that you are that person that is going to be one of those that turns the hearts of the fathers to the children and children to the fathers. You carry a fatherly anointing for the impartation of the gift of the pro prophetic. For in these last days, I will use you, if you allow me to, to raise up sons and daughters that will flow. You will, you will release offspring in the spirit that will flow and carry the mantle of the prophet in this hour. For there is a great need of fathers to impart to the the generation coming forth and I'm asking you tonight will you be one of the fathers to release the mantle the generation for you have that heart you have carried it for many trials and tribulations have formed the image of that heart in you but know this night I have always called you to be one of those that would carry that spirit so just wait and see what I do in this hour for surely I am changing your DNA for surely I am rearranging things for surely your life Last years will be greater than your former. Just rest in me. Stay close to me. And I will lead and guide you every step of the way. In Jesus' name. Got something. <laughs> I heard the Lord say, tell my son, revival for him is now. I am he who restores all things. Rest 
in my love for you. Rest in my purpose for you. Rest, says God, in me. For I will say unto you today, this day you have entered my rest. Where you will cease from your labor and you will come into a place called peace. Divine peace. Divine truth and divine revelation. Not because you are striving to enter that place. It's because I have put you in that place. I'll place you in me and I am in you, my son. I'm filling you up. I'm filling you up. Know this day. As thou yield and surrender. As thou have said, God, I have nothing left. He says, this is the place I've been waiting for. For where you are empty. Now I'm about to fill you. Yes. Tell him this. If he will believe, your latter yes. will be greater than your former. Yes. For unless I build the house, the labor is in vain. You are my building. I'm building you, says the Lord. Tell him it's not the season to sit down, to give up and quit. Rise up, says the Lord. Take your mat and run. For the hour and the time has come. For you to enjoy the beauty, the beauty of our relationship, the beauty of your salvation, says the Lord. Amen. Yeah, amen. Ken said at one point, he said that was an answer to prayer. And, and um, God has perfect timing, doesn't he? He has absolute perfect timing. So um, it's hard to close, but we're going to close. And if someone does need prayer... Not for two or three hours. Um, but if someone does need prayer and they're not sure they're calling, um, one of the leaders will be happy to pray with you. And so we really thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you for, for your heart for the Lord. The Lord moved so powerfully tonight, and I really believe it's because you were all pulling. You were all requesting. You were all asking. You were all going, God, we cannot even sit here and, and, and do this without you tonight. We need to be changed. And so thank you so much for coming. You're all so greatly appreciated. And have a wonderful evening.